He's so indicted and he just can't hide it. We're about to lose control. And I think I like it. I'm Matt Robeson. This is the Balance of Power Roundtable. We're part of the Beyond Politics podcast. We're available wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, on YouTube, on the Blue Amp channel. I am joined as usual by our panel of conservative commentator, analyst, and consultant, Alicia Preston, and former Democratic U.S. congressman, and important for this show, former prosecutor of white collar crimes, Paul Hodes. Here's what we're doing for all of our listeners. We are recording this at 3.34 p.m. on April 4th, Trump indictment and arraignment day. We don't have all the facts right now. We're well aware of this. But we also know that a lot of people are working and engaged in their lives and haven't been following the news coverage with the kind of breathless attention that the three of us have. So <laughs> we are going to record this very quick reaction show right now. We may find out things live as we go, but this is by no means meant to be an in-depth analysis. We're going to come back and record more tomorrow morning when we've had a chance to really dig into what we've learned. But Speaking of what we've learned, I'd like to start with you, Paul Hodes, as usual, leaning into your expertise as a former assistant attorney general. You have prosecuted white collar crimes, which we now know is essentially what Donald Trump is accused of here. Could you tell us, first of all, from a legal standpoint, just a snapshot, what do we know now following the arraignment that we didn't know last night? Sure. First and overarching in some ways is the fact that Donald Trump is now an arre indicted, arrested, arraigned criminal defendant. He is charged in the state of New York, we now know, with 34 different felony counts. The What we know is that there are no misdemeanors charged. Could be unusual, and it poses an interesting burden for the prosecution. We know that those felony counts comprise at least two kinds of crimes. One are his crimes, falsifying business records, and he's also charged with conspiracy. I don't know how many counts of conspiracy, but conspiracy. The over we know also from the narrative of the that we heard discussed in court through a reporter who was inside that the prosecution referenced that the ultimate aim of the conspiracy or part of what they're charged with was interfering with and obstructing the election. And can I add to you there? I'm not going to add to legal analysis. I'm just literally, we're going to do this throughout this show. So everything you just said was very predictive because the way you set that up is perfect. The New York Times fresh, literally right now, just a headline, here are the 34 charges against Trump. As you say, it's 34 felony counts of falsifying business records in the first degree. They're all class E felonies, which are the lowest category of felony offense in New York, and carry a maximum prison sentence of a four years per count. That is something I'm going to want to ask you about here. Um, and it says that New under New York law, falsifying business records is generally a misdemeanor, but and this is the point you were literally just making, Paul. See, you were a bona fide prosecutor. Falsifying business records is generally a misdemeanor, but prosecutors can escalate the charge when they believe a person falsified business records in order to commit another crime or hide the committing of a crime. So what's your reaction as that gets layered into your already ongoing analysis? So there's a number of potential crimes that could be charged as that editor that raises it from a misdemeanor to a felony. One of them is a crime against the election law, and it could be federal election law, or it could be state election law, though it's uh, more likely that if they say anything, it'll be about federal election law. And then it could be some other crime as if you intend to interfere with and obstruct an election, that could be a separate crime from a campaign violation. So there are no, we don't, not having read the indictment yet, not having seen it yet, sure. we're not going to go further. But clearly they thought there were a sufficient, there was sufficient evidence. The other thing we didn't- well, Can I ask you a quick follow-up about that? Sure. I'm not a lawyer, yep. but I can do math. By my math, 34 counts with up to four years in prison per count. Does this mean that Donald Trump could go to prison for 100 
32 years? Technically, yes. Practically, no. The business crimes that have been charged, this, it's pretty standard when you charge bad business crimes, a white collar falsifying business records. It's fairly standard that every time you put your pencil to the paper, you've committed another felony. So don't get fooled by the number of counts. What's interesting in the indictment and from a legal standpoint is when we see it, because there's a conspiracy count, conspiracy has a very different flavor and impact in a legal sense than business crimes. And what it means for one thing is that the indictment will probably lay out a scheme because conspiracy mm. is when you make an agreement with somebody to commit some other crime. And the gist of the conspiracy charge is the agreement in for, and somebody does something to commit a crime, for example. Trump could be charged to have conspired with Michael Cohen to make this illegal payment to Stormy Daniels and then to cover it up. Something for which Michael Cohen has already served prison time. And it's like you've got half. Yeah, you got that one, boy. It's, it's like a, it's like one of those heart lockets where it's like you've got the picture of one side of the couple and the That's other a, picture. Let me ask, yeah. Can I just bring Alicia into this for a second? Because one of the things that you've been saying consistently that I think is a point very well taken, Alicia, is there's a big question here of how will the American public take this? And your argument has been that it's ultimately about a campaign finance violation. And you've said, and just to remind everyone here, you're a conservative, you're still in the Republican Party, but you are a never Trump. You are a Trump hating son of a gun. All right. I don't hate anybody because as we discussed last week, right. hate consumes the you're, hater. Let us remember. Hate. You Thank are you. you are a negativist. I'm Donald a negativist. Trump. Yes. Your concern was that this is going to be so abstract and it's going to seem so minor. It's like campaign finance violation, jaywalking. But it's very interesting to my ears that the way Paul just characterized, this is about fraud. And this is about conspiracy. This is about business fraud. That feels different to me. If the headline here is 34 felony counts of business fraud, does that change anything in your mind or no? Yes. I was very surprised that all 34 counts were felonies. I didn't see that coming. I've been watching the news nonstop for days. Nobody else, no analysts and talking heads that are lawyers who know more than me, like Paul does, Saw that come. Some of the discussion that was allegedly in the courtroom, I didn't see coming. At the moment, I'm not doing a lot of thinking. I'm doing a lot of feeling. And no, I am not a supporter of Donald Trump. I have never been a supporter of Donald Trump. But my biggest thought right now is my emotion. And my emotion is sad. I think it's a very sad day for America. Can I, Whether can I, you like me, Donald Trump or not. Can I just follow up on that? Look, I did an interview earlier today with WMUR-TV, and what I said was, this is a challenging time. There's no doubt it's a challenging time, but it also means that the justice system is working. And here's a really interesting thing that I want to highlight about what I heard, what's going on, and what I think other people in the media are going to be talking about. In the courtroom, the prosecution spent time talking about Donald Trump's mode of operation, mm. threats to Alan Bragg, threats to destroy the country, threats of violence, a baseball bat parked next to the prosecutor, calling out the judge, all the threats that Donald Trump had made. Now, remember, those threats occurred in the wake of January 6th, okay? That's still under discussion, January 6th. And his and and, Trump and can I add that Alvin Bragg, the DA here, has a history here because in 2017 and 2018, he was a senior official in the New York attorney to the state attorney general's office. And he was on the inside as the state brought suit accusing the Donald J. Trump Foundation and the Trump fa family of a, quote, shocking pattern of illegality. And that lawsuit was successful and the foundation was dissolved. And so when you say this, Paul, you're saying that Alvin Bragg, in the way he's pitching this publicly, making the public case, and in the courtroom, is saying this is part of a pattern here. And are, now, are you saying that he's doing this to win in the court of public opinion, no, or is he saying a, that he's doing this no, it, it, to set up a, to set up a case in the courtroom itself? No, wait a second. There are some really important legal things going on. If the justice system is to function, the justice system has to be as pure 
as it can be, insulated from public opinion so that the 12 jurors who are ultimately going to hear this case, assuming there is not a plea agreement in the case, are not, are not, their views aren't set by what happens in the public before they get into the courtroom. Because in the court of law, you want to be able to present the evidence, not the opinions. So that the court of law is different than the court of public opinion, people. We are now in a court of law. And one of the important things about this is it may be a judge who sets conditions of release, who will have a the strongest words to say to Donald Trump about his proclivity to incite riots and threaten people because he's gotten away with it his whole life. Well, Alicia, this sets up something that you and I have spoken about before. Sorry, did you want to jump in there? Go ahead, please. I just had a question for Paul. When will we know or will we know what the conditions of release are if there's been any gag order or anything like that put on Trump or his legal team? We shouldn't. I'm thinking we would know today or tomorrow because the judge has to make a de some determination. There may be some further hearings on conditions of release. What's the judge going to do tonight? He says, I want to think about all this and issue it tomorrow. Does he say, take him away? Put him in a jail cell? Mm. Does he put him on under house arrest with an ankle bracelet and guards and say and take away his cell phones? Does we don't know what the judge, what other action the judge took, because that's exactly what I wanted to go. I was going to prompt you, Alicia, but maybe, Paul, you want to weigh in on this as well. Would you say, Paul, that it's less likely that what we're going to see here is you're going to stay in jail? Or no, you're, not, you're, you're under house arrest. It is conceivable that there would be some kind of a prohibition from the judge on public statements from Absolutely. Donald Trump. And that's where I was going to, boy, I, Alicia, you and I have spoken about this before, the tension in any political operation. You and I are political operatives. Paul is a political principal, right? right. Politics speak, he's the guy, but you've got a guy or a gal who's actually the candidate. And then you've got a whole bunch of flax who hide in the shadows. You're actually literally a little shadowed right now. It's right on the nose. I wanted there. to fit the image. Yeah, perfect. There are folks like us who sit behind them and there's a tension frequently between the legal team and the politics slash communications team. Been there. And been there. Mm -hmm. Alyssa Farrow was just on, the former Trump comms director was just on CNN talking about this and predicting that there was probably some real hand-to-hand -hand combat, that's not a term we should use in connection to Donald Trump lightly, going on in Trump's inner circle up through last night about the kind of statements he would make, what he would put on social media, what he would, like what the Trump team would say, because there's a real tension. You could do yourself some major legal damage at the same time as you're following Donald Trump's political best practices. Are you seeing that at play here? Because boy, I, I mean, his whole approach is be combative, raise money. They announced they raised 4 million since the announcement of the indictment. I mean, that could easily run afoul of a restriction on social media or a gag order here. Look, this is a man who just this morning attacked the judge's daughter. Could you be any stupider when you're about to walk into his courtroom? But I'll tell you what I saw. The man that walked into that courtroom, that sat in that courtroom, and then walked out was not the man he was 30 minutes before he was told he had 34 felony indictments against him. Does that make him wake up? Does that make him shut the hell up? Does it make his staff realize, okay, we want him to be president again and consultants, we want to keep taking 15 grand a month from him for as long as we can. Does it make them go, a man's life and freedom is now at stake and that's more important? I don't know. A lot of people have latched on to the coattails of Donald Trump, probably for all the wrong reasons, and do not have his best interest in mind. So I think it's a different scenario. Look, I've been on high level campaigns and teams, never where there was 34 felony issues, but where there were issues before and you do butt heads. Not good, it's not a good thing for your candidate. No, to not good. More felonies. It doesn't, it ultimately makes a problem. It makes a problem. Right. But look, have had to deal with legal teams many times over the years and you butt heads because one interest is from a legal standpoint and the other interest is from a communication political standpoint and they often contradict. But we're in a different ball game now. We're in a completely different place. We have a former president of the United States of America, a leading Republican candidate for president of the United States of America, who has 34 felony counts against him. He saw it. He realizes it. We saw it on his face. 
And the best thing this communications campaign can do is tell Donald Trump to shut up. If they want him to be president, he can't be in jail. And I want to just circle back on that point to what Paul was saying a moment ago, which is that Bragg just issued a statement in which he said, quote, Manhattan is home to the country's most significant business market. We cannot allow New York businesses to manipulate their records to cover up criminal conduct. So make no mistake, that is a savvy PR statement that's not intended for consumption inside the courtroom. He does have two fronts he's fighting this war on. And the most significant one, obviously, is it's all about the legal case. He has to win the legal case. But he's not blind to what's going on outside the courtroom. And by very assiduously framing this as this is about business fraud, this is committing fraud, I think what he's done is he's taken that concern, Alicia, that you highlighted of won't people think of this as jaywalking because it's an election law violation? And he's transmuted it into, no, I'm reframing this. This is business fraud. So from absent the legal context, just in a pure politics context, that is very smart. And I think there's a good- You know why it's, here's why it's so smart, Matt, because part of the reason that Alicia has picked up or has sensed or has said that it's a nothing burger is because in the beginning of all this, people connected this case to a porn actress yeah, and slimy, stupid, oh, it's just an affair. It's just a porn actress. It's something like that. This case is now a very different case, not because there are payments to two different women. There are two different, there's a whole cast of characters there. It's a pattern of wanting to pay off women with whom they, he had alleged affairs in order to keep it hush in the election so as not to interfere and to make and to then claim it as a campaign contribution. So that pattern is more about the business fraud. And that is why it's so, frankly, brilliant of the Manhattan DA to be so clear and so concise that his job is maintaining the integrity of the financial system in New York City, which is the leading city in the world for financial affairs and financial crime. And he understands that is also in terms of communicating and in terms of the politics of all this, perhaps the best thing, smartest thing, and truest thing he could say in order to avoid, you know, that it's a, certainly a good answer for this is just a political prosecution. What you said before, surmising that there would be an element of a conspiracy in here, is indeed, as the indictment has come out, and I have it in front of me right here, paragraph two um, starts with, from August 2015 to December 2017, the defendant orchestrated a scheme with others to influence the 2016 presidential election by identifying and purchasing negative information about him to suppress its publication and benefit the defendant's electoral mm. prospects wow. in order to execute wow. Wow. the unlawful scheme. Wow. The participants violated election laws and made wow. and caused false entries in the business records of various entities in New York. Wow. The participants also took steps that mischaracterized for tax purposes, the true nature of the payments made in furtherance of the scheme. I just, I, I want to zoom that. So first of all, Paul, you nailed it. Hell yeah. Second of all, I just want to zoom this back to the politics and comms side of this for a second. That language is, you can evaluate it from a legal standpoint, but reading it from politics context, it's really putting the, it, it, it's putting the election law piece of it in a context. This larger was a, context. A larger context. This was a scheme with others, i.e. a conspiracy. And it's about it's not about the money and the like campaign contribution limits. Nope. It's a focal point here is this is about how he conspired to identify and purchase negative information and suppress its publication to help him become president. It's some real dirty dealing in that sense. And then the real crux of it is falsifying business records, false entries in the business records of various entries in order to mischaracterize for tax purposes, bringing in tax law, the true nature of the payments. So again, to me, and this is just a first appraisal here, I think that the first attempt, I put out a video about this on the Blue Amp channel, going through the five stages of grief of Fox News hosts, which were hilarious as they tried to deny 
and defend and they went through sadness. And then they tried to say, maybe this is all good news. And they got outraged over the idea of, you know, this point, let's, let's like a misdemeanor over the finance contributions. That is not, I think, what the ensuing conversation is going to be about. This is going to be about Donald Trump is a criminal fraudster. And Paul, to your point, he has a long context and history of this kind of behavior. And it it seems like by, by charging this as part of a conspiracy, this is going to bring in the likely witnesses here of not just Stormy Daniels, but Karen McDougal and Michael Cohen, potentially Alan Weisselberg. This could be there could be multiple proof points that this hinges on. And this just goes to my larger point that I think that this is going to be politically much worse for Donald Trump than the Fox News crowd thought it would be. Your reactions? This is not, for having heard from you about the way they charged that conspiracy count, this is not a nothing burger. This is huge. That conspiracy count says he committed business fraud to attempt to steal the election or to influence the election improperly. It is a, it could be thought of as charging a crime that has politics in it because the scheme was about the integrity of our national election. So it's a fascinating, from a legal standpoint, not only is he the first ex-president ever to have been indicted, he is now being charged with orchestrating interference with the election that got him elected president by falsifying business records. I appreciate both of you not only offering trenchant political and legal analysis, but also filibustering for a minute or two there so that I could scan through this actual indictment because it's really well written and it tells a story, which is what any good piece of writing should do. And it tells the story of a conspiracy about how David Pecker, who is the, yes, that's his real name, who was the CEO of the company that owned the National Enquirer. Matter of the discussion, but okay. Yeah, okay, there it is. <laughs> Here we go. Friend. Here we go. The inevitable slide down the shovel <laughs> into yes, the it's... garbage. Heap. And we so devolve bad. again. <laughs> it's so bad. So anywho, <laughs> David Pecker, I, can say, can, I can't say that enough, um, you know, is an old friend of Donald Trump's. And it's long been known that he had this catch and release approach where you would go to someone who had dirt to dish and you'd buy their story. You'd buy the exclusive rights to their story so that they could only tell it publicly to you and to no one else, or they would pay a huge penalty. And it's called catch and kill because what you do is you buy the rights and then you never publish a story. And the indictment lays out that first they did this with the doorman in Trump Tower who alleged that Donald Trump had a, a child out of wedlock. And then it gets into the scheme around Stormy Daniels. And what's so interesting about this, it lays out, here are the meetings that were had with Alan Weisselberg. Here are the meetings that were had with Donald Trump's attorney. Here are the meetings that were had, and there are recordings of some of these with Donald Trump himself. And so you really do begin to get a picture here of this was what Bragg is calling it. it was a scheme. And when you see all of the back and forth, the discussion, the David Pecker updated lawyer A, Donald Trump's lawyer, regularly about the matter over text and telephone. Ultimately, uh, AMI falsely characterized the payment to woman one, which is presumably Stormy Daniels, falsely characterized the payment in their books and records, including in a general ledger. The fact that all of this in a conversation captured in an audio recording in approximately September 2016 concerning woman one's account, the defendant, Donald Trump and lawyer A, which maybe that's Michael Cohen, discussed how to obtain the rights to woman one's account from AMI and how to reimburse AMI for its payment. There's an audio recording here, people. So, boy, I'm not going to judge the strength of the legal case, but again, all of this is going to come out in the course of the trial. This goes back to my primary contention here, which is this Fox News line that, oh, this is great for Donald Trump. Look, he's rising in the polls. This is going to this is going to absolutely convince people that he should be the nominee of the Republican Party. It feels like a fantasy. 
I don't know how all of this is going to sound when that audio recording comes out. So I, to me, this feels like a political yeah. lead anchor around Donald Trump's neck. All right. So you said a moment ago that we should not be lured into the math exercise of saying 34 counts times up to four years in prison yeah, count equals 132. A, what in your experience, let's say he were found guilty on all 34 counts, what would a more likely prison term be? If he's found guilty in this context, any prison time for Donald Trump, you know, in a way it doesn't matter whether it's a day, a week, a month, a year, or three years. He's a first time offender, but he did violate a rather large position of trust. He did a really bad thing in these business dealings to interfere with the election to become president. There's a pattern. So it is possible that a judge could send a signal to Donald Trump and say, while it's unusual, for a first-time offender to see the inside of Rikers. Mm. In this case, the court believes that the behavior was so heinous that the court finds compelling reasons to commit you to incarceration for a period of six months. I see. And I, I just, I'll do one more thing again, Paul, just to your legal instincts were spot on. The New York Times has just ratified your and a posting saying, while the word conspiracy does not appear in the district attorney's 13 page statement of facts that I've just been reading excerpts from on the air here, the document does read like a conspiracy indictment describing how Trump orchestrated a scheme with others. We will be back with much more. But for now, for Paul and Alicia, I'm Matt Robeson. We will see you very soon.